kind of have some scattered thoughts about the reaction to Nashville and the way that we as a country tend to address and discuss horrible events like this. And in short, it sucks. It's deranged. It's unhinged. It makes things worse. It divides us more. So I was just giving an example in the last segment about how I had tweeted the detail, quoting someone else, that apparently this shooter had another target in mind as well, decided not to go after that target because there was security at that target. So went to the defenseless children to murder them instead. That was the extent of my tweet. I didn't call for anything. And I had people saying, filling up in my replies and direct messages that I'm some sort of idiot, knuckle-dragging right-winger who thinks that security and guns and police solve all the problems, which, of course, is not something that I said. But it does, as I was saying, seem to me that perhaps having good guys with guns at soft targets where these types of demented people, now it's like the playbook for these people. right? If you want to go out this way, you go to a school and start shooting. This is like what the worst, craziest, most evil people in our society do. So we can recognize that and we can say we're not going to turn these places into prisons, but maybe we can have some armed security. Should be part of the conversation. And then people who disagree with that come back and say, oh, you're just fetishizing guns. Good guys with guns don't work. Set aside all the examples, counterexamples, that disprove that point. It's not a foolproof solution. I admit it because there is no foolproof solution to this issue. There isn't. So at least in my mind, one thing that we can perhaps productively, constructively talk about is what security at schools should look like. Not saying it's, you know, going to be a catch-all final answer to this, but it's something. And people come back and say, well, that could hurt the kids more. It would be disturbing for them to see all these armed guards. We've had other schools throw the police out because of an anti-cop agenda. You know, there's there's a lot of stuff that goes into this. Like, oh, it's too expensive. Who pays for it? It's not realistic. Now, I think some of the objections to the stepping up of school security at least make some sense to me. Like, I understand where they're coming from. It gives me pause. That's a fair point. How would we work through that? Who has the authority to make these decisions, right? There are reasonable downsides because there are trade-offs to any solution, quote unquote, that might be put out there. And I think if we're going to be adults and try to get to a place where we're not perfectly safe, but kids are better off, then adults should be able to talk about these things. But instead, people go straight to this like partisan warfare footing. And by the way, if I wanted to, just to get a little bit more partisan and ideological here for a second, because this really bothers me, if I wanted to argue the way that a lot of people on the left argue after mass shootings, this is what I would say when someone, perhaps on the other side of the aisle, would bring up some concerns or drawbacks or objections, no matter how thoughtful, to the school security armed guard proposal. I would say, well, I would rather have an armed guard than more dead kids. You disagree. You must love dead kids. The blood is on your hands, too. You're complicit. You're part of this pro-child death cult in your political party because you won't do what's necessary to protect these kids. And so I don't know why you're okay with these dead kids. I don't know how many more children need to be murdered and slaughtered until you have the courage to do what's needed here, right? That is the way the gun control people 
Many of them argue all the time after these things. And I get it. People are emotional when children have been shot. We all are. No one likes this. We all hate it. We have different views about what can or should be done about it. But I have to tell you, if the little fake rant that I just went on about leftist loving dead kids, if that's something that I actually said, like, sincerely, like I went on special report tonight and that was my analysis. If you disagree with me about school security, you love dead kids. No one would take me seriously. I wouldn't be able to look at myself in the mirror. I don't believe that. What a horrible thing to say about half the country. I would be written right out of any sort of, you know, polite circle of punditry. Like, look at that absolute crazy crackpot. And I would probably deserve it. And yet that is a common refrain. It's almost like one of the things It's like part of the dogma. It's part of the canon on the anti-gun left these days to smear opponents as being either okay with or actively complicit in the bloodshed against children because people might raise concerns about so-called solutions involving guns, no matter how reasonable those concerns are because they have to emote and show how angry and how much better they are as people than other folks. And that's the path that we go down. And then guess what? There's a backlash to that and people get really offended. They get really upset as they should with that kind of slander. And then they're in much less of a mood to maybe have a constructive conversation or figure out where we might agree. Cause you're telling me that we love dead kids. So guess what? Go bleep yourself. And that's where we end up almost instantaneously. Whenever this happens, Also, the thoughts and prayers mockery, that's always a nice one. Where you have people, like people aren't even given the opportunity to grieve or mourn or express sadness or concern in a completely reasonable human way. When something unfathomably awful happens, people say, my God, we need God. May God be with these people and these families. And we have like an official talking point now to immediately ridicule and attack that and reject that as insufficient. And her how dare you? You could take your thoughts and prayers and shove it unless you do exactly what we want. You're bad. It's crazy. And then we hear from some of our friends on the left you know, one of the definitions of insanity is to do the same thing over and over again and expect different results. And they say that about conservatives who make the same arguments on guns. Well, guess what? The pattern is always the same, it feels like, in a really demoralizing and depressing way. Where the news breaks, you've got the gut punch. Here we go. School shooting. People who are really broken-brained in their tribes are just waiting for details hoping that the details will support their ideological cause so they can bludgeon the other side with whatever talking point they're going to use because people are already sitting there at their battle stations ready to go. And before we even know the details, before the families have been alerted about the death of their child, for example, people are screaming at each other. On social media and it bleeds over into other media as well and you might say well that's not real life that's true to an extent also we're a culture addicted to little screens and what happens on our little screens and ends up infecting our real life as well so you have people at the top of their digital lungs screaming the worst possible things about each other highlighting the very worst things being said by the other side like that's representative and it's off to the races. Oh, you make your point. Let me guess. You want to ban some guns. Well, let me make my point. That doesn't make sense. That's not constitutional. It wouldn't have, under the fact pattern that we're still discovering right now, wouldn't have impacted this particular shooting, the solution that you're objecting to. Oh, yeah, well, we can't just do nothing. Why do you love dead kids? Well, screw you. And, and like you can almost script it. 
Talk about doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. We do this disgusting national ritual of hating each other every time. And what does it achieve? Right after Uvalde, there was actually a bipartisan bill. That was pretty reasonable. We talked about it here. I supported it. A lot of conservatives disagreed. A lot of them said we can't give an inch. I actually understand that because there's a lot of bad faith out there. And when you give an inch, then the next time something happens, they say they pretend like the inch never happened. They say it's not enough and they want more. That's why a lot of people say, no, we're going to draw a bright line, not a single inch. But what do we achieve? Honestly, we we move on from the latest atrocity, angrier, more entrenched, more embittered, no closer to actually finding solutions. We're just a lot madder and angrier at each other. Does that seem healthy or does that like cauldron of hatred and anger and resentment perhaps lead to more violent events? Possibly. I am not a believer in blaming rhetoric for this stuff. I'm very consistent on this. Right. When Left wingers and Democrats and left wing media were all yelling and screaming about how evil Republicans are and their policies are killing people, which they do every day, including on trans issues, by the way. That's the way they argue. You disagree with us? You are killing people. Doesn't seem like a good way to debate things. That's just me. But when the guy at the baseball field showed up and tried to mass assassinate a bunch of Republican congressmen, That day, I wrote a piece about how it is not the fault of Democrats or their unhinged rhetoric. The guy was like a Rachel Maddow addict or whatever. Not her fault. You don't blame entire groups of people for the demented, deranged, violent actions of an extremist in that tribe. You don't do it if you want to be fair, if you want to be decent. It's not fair. And yet... Sorry to be this way, get a little tribal. The other side does it every single time to conservatives, whether the facts support it or not. Remember the Gabby Gifford shooting out in Arizona years ago now? They turned that into a right-wing rhetoric panic, a big, like, three-week national conversation about our rhetoric. They rearranged the seating assignments of the State of the Union because of the right-wing rhetoric problem and the culture of hate. Sarah Palin had a map and all this stuff. None of that was true. The shooter was a schizophrenic lunatic, personally obsessed with this woman. There was no politics involved. None. But they just went straight for the politics. It's the right wing fault. There wasn't even a right wing shooter in this case. Every time conservatives get blamed for this stuff. And it's sort of like conservatives get blamed no matter what. Right, because it's a gun thing, so obviously conservatives are to blame. That's first. And then even if it turns out that the shooter or the killer in this case might have been a left winger motivated by crazy left wing stuff, egged on perhaps by a bunch of deranged left wing rhetoric, they say, well, you know, and you're already seeing hints at this. ABC News and, and other, oh, you know, look at the trans legislation that's happening in Tennessee. Almost like, oh, maybe blame the victims. Maybe the nine-year-old's parents voted for some people who are doing things deemed anti-trans. So, you know, we don't condone the violence, but maybe you know, what did the right-wingers do to bring this upon their children is part of the conversation that happened as soon as the trans detail came out. Because, oh, uh-oh, that's not a good one for one tribe. How do we deal with that? How do we gender this person? How do we make sure it's still the right wing's fault? Then you have some people on the right trying to blame the whole thing on the trans community or the LGBT community and activists. Your rhetoric did this. Well, if if we do the rhetoric thing, then yes. If this is how we respond to things, where we assign someone an ideology and then smear and tar everyone associated with that ideology to try to discredit them and score cheap political points because there's blood on the ground, then yes, this is the right-wing version of what the left does every time. My argument is don't do that. It's not right. There's a reason why I get so angry when the left does it 
because it's so unfair. And I get the human instinct to want to just like fight fire with fire and say, these are your rules. And, oh, sorry, you don't like it. Here you go. Your fault. Kids blood on your hands. How do you like that? All right. So that feels good for about four seconds. Then what? What does that achieve? Nothing. Think the left will be better next time? Some of these, like, you know, radical activists will just abandon their playbook because it was used against them once? I don't think so. I get forcing the other side to live by their standards sometimes is necessary in politics. In situations like this, if you can convince me it would achieve anything productive, maybe we can talk about it. But to me, it's just it's not the right thing to do. So I've talked about it on the show. I've written about it at townhall.com. Unfortunately, it's like part of the job description now. If you're in political media, you're going to be writing and talking about mass shootings and the reaction to mass shootings. And it's depressing on the merits and then just all the noise around it makes it even worse. And depending on whether the facts fit a certain narrative, because the media absolutely takes sides immediately on this stuff. It's one of their worst biases. They don't even really try. If it doesn't fit a certain narrative, well, then it just seems to disappear awfully quickly. If not, national conversation for weeks because the bad guys are under fire. And maybe we can do our solution this time. And if you question the solution, well, then maybe you're just fine with dead kids. And on and on it goes. Talk about the definition of insanity. I don't have a great solution. I can't imagine we can do it much worse than this. 